Greetings and thank you for joining us for our webinar today about how LSVT Loud and LSVT Big can benefit people with advanced Parkinson's disease. We're delighted to have you join us and uh, we want to give you a little bit of information on today's webinar uh, shortly. But before we get started, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Laura Gousset. I'm one of the LSVT Big training and certification faculty as well as the Chief Clinical Officer of LSVT Big for LSVT Global. And I'll be moderating today's session. And uh, our presenters today are Dr. Cynthia Fox and Heather Siance. And in just a moment, we will introduce them a little more thoroughly. Before we go any further, we would like to acknowledge the funding support that has made LSVT Big and LSVT Loud possible and what they are today. Over the years, we've received generous funding support from the National Institutes of Health, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Parkinson's Alliance, and the Davis Finney Foundation. So today our presenters are Dr. Cynthia Fox, who's our Vice President of Operations and the co-founder of LSVT Global, and she serves as faculty for both the LSVT Loud and LSVT Big training and certification workshops. I'm joined by Heather Siance, who is also one of our LSVT Big Training and Certification faculty. So I want to go over our plan for today's webinar. First, I'm going to go over some of the logistics in case you haven't joined us for a webinar before. Uh, webinars are quite fun and easy, and we're going to be presenting some content today. And at the end of the webinar, we will have time to answer your questions you might have related to this topic. You'll also notice that in the control panel on the right side of your screen, uh, there is a tab called Handouts. If you click on the Handout uh, tab, you can download our handout from today's webinar and print it and save it for future reference. So in terms of how to ask questions at the end of the webinar, there are a few different ways. One of the ways is that you can simply type in your question in the question box. And at the end of the webinar, we'll read your question out loud so that everyone can hear it. It'll be anonymous, and one of the presenters will answer the question. The second way that you can ask a question is to raise your hand. And on your control panel, you might see a little hand icon. If you click on that, I will see that your hand is raised. When I see that, I'll call out your name, I'll unmute your microphone, and then you'll be able to ask your question out loud um, to the presenters and to the audience. And the third way is simply by emailing us. So if we run out of time or you need a question answered uh, more privately or that's a little bit longer, you can email us anytime at info as an information at lsvtglobal.com. And at the end of the webinar, I'll repeat those instructions again just to uh, refresh your memory. So today we're going to be discussing the application of LSVT Loud and LSVT Big to individuals with advanced Parkinson's disease. We've had this topic uh, presented a number of times, and we're bringing it back as an encore presentation because it's been a very, very uh, popular topic and we really hope that the information presented today will be useful to you as well whether you're a person with Parkinson's or maybe a caregiver or just uh, someone interested in helping people with Parkinson's disease. At the very end of the webinar there will be a survey I believe that will be launched at the conclusion of the webinar. It should take less than uh, five minutes to complete and will pop up once you click X to exit out of the webinar. Um, if the survey doesn't pop up, no worries. We will email you a link to the survey after the completion of the webinar. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Fox and Dr. Uh, and Heather Siance just a little bit um, more in depth. Um, Dr. Fox is one of our co-founders of LSVT Global and like I said, has been one of the faculty on both the LSVT Loud and the LSVT Big teams. And she is a world expert in the topics of speech treatment for people with Parkinson's and on neuroplasticity and motor learning. And she is not only one of our founders, but has been instrumental in developing much of the research on LSVT as well as the treatment protocols themselves. 
Heather Ciance joins us from the Dan Aaron's Parkinson's Rehab Center in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. And she is quite an expert on LSVT big and on Parkinson's disease. Um, she's been a great instructor for us. She's been involved in a number of continuing education courses um, through uh, the National Parkinson's Foundation is also on the board of Cure PSP. We do uh, disclose to you that we have um, uh, financial and non-financial relationships with LSVT Loud and LSVT Big listed here. Here are the objectives for today's webinar. Uh, we're going to define, define advanced Parkinson's disease and talk about how goals of LSVT Loud and LSVT Big may differ for people with advanced Parkinson's disease as compared to individuals with early Parkinson's disease. And lastly, we're going to list some ways in which those treatment strategies can be really tailored or customized to meet the needs of people specifically with advanced Parkinson's disease. So with that, we're going to open up our first polling question. Now that you know a little bit about us as presenters, uh, we would like to know a little bit more about you too. So just one moment here, and I'm going to bring up this polling question, and you will be able to uh, answer it live. So you should see this question on your screen now. I'll give you a few seconds to respond to this polling question of who are you. And there's some different choices there that you can see. All right. I'm going to close the poll. And it looks like, I'll show the results here. 67% of you said you are a person with Parkinson's disease. 11% of you said you're a care partner. And we have no one that answered that they're a certified or a non-certified therapist. And 22% of you said other. So thank you. Um, it's nice for us to know who's joining us for, for our webinars. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cynthia Fox, who is going to give you an introduction on uh, advanced Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Laura, and we welcome you all to the webinar today. Excited to have you join us for this uh, important topic. And so we thought it's a... Uh, um, important to first define what really is encompassed in this umbrella term of advanced Parkinson's disease and what is typically considered an advanced stage. Next slide. So one of the rating scales that is used sometimes by movement disordered specialists is the modified honan yar scale. And this scale has a staging from stage one of unilateral disease to stage five. And typically, for the designation of advanced Parkinson's disease, we're looking at those later stages, stage four, defined as severe disability, but may still be able to walk or stand unassisted. And stage five, where a person may really be wheelchair-bound or bedridden unless aided. Next slide. And while that's a kind of a gross overall staging, um, there's some additional and probably better descriptions of really what advanced Parkinson's disease entails. And so typically, it's the onset of motor complications, really despite very aggressive pharmacological and behavioral management. So when those traditional therapies begin to fail, and oftentimes motor complications arise, these can be wearing off on fluctuations, uh, the increase in dyskinesias, and so that's the increased movements that can happen when a person takes, for example, their cinnamon medicine, or simply a drug response failure. So whereas previously the neuropharmacology was managing symptoms, now it is not as effective or not effective at all. Next slide. And as you can imagine, uh, these motor as well as some non-motor complications can really dramatically impair quality of life. Next slide. 
And some of those motor complications of advanced Parkinson disease are increased difficulty with walking. Uh, as I mentioned, people may be bedridden or wheelchair bound. Oftentimes, it, it, people are no longer able to live alone um, because of the increased need for care and certainly increased risk for falls. And as we know, with falls, many other bad things can happen, fractures or TBI, which stands for a traumatic brain injury, so hitting one's head, breaking one's hip. Um, assistance may be needed with many activities for daily living, things like getting up in the morning, getting to the bathroom, getting dressed, feeding, um, and more uh, need for assistive devices. There also may be increased severity of bradykinesia, which is the slow movement, hypokinesia, small movement, and just overall rigidity or increased stiffness. Again, that may have previously responded quite well to medication, but no longer is. Um, we already mentioned those motor complications, so let's go on to the next slide and talk about some of the non-motor characteristics of advanced Parkinson disease. In some cases, but certainly not all individuals with advanced Parkinson disease have this, but dementia um, can be a risk factor. Uh, sometimes, again, related to the medications, um, psychosis or hallucinations, uh, increased risk for depression, anxiety, and apathy, sleep disorders, autonomic dysfunction, and pain. And pain that may be central pain or pain that may be due to inactivity or some of that stiffness. Next slide. When we look specifically at some of the speech characteristics of advanced Parkinson disease, we can define them differently from what happens in early speech. So we know that speech changes are extremely common in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, it's been estimated up to 89% uh, of individuals will have changes, and even early changes up to 78%. Things such as a softer voice, monotone loudness, monotone pitch, some hoarseness or harshness or breathy voice quality. Early in Parkinson's disease, these subtle changes can be very frustrating for a person because uh, the person may feel quite happy, quite engaged on the inside, but because the voice has gotten soft and monotone and perhaps the face slightly masked, outsiders may perceive that individual as not being uh, interested in the conversation or bored or apathetic, when in reality that's absolutely not true. As Parkinson's disease advances, uh, there are more challenges with articulation. Um, sometimes vocal tremor can be a problem and sometimes changes in rate. Next slide. And a very uh, unique characteristic of speech changes in advanced Parkinson's disease is something called a repetitive speech phenomenon. And there's two different ways to describe this. One is that a person may really get disfluent speech or stuttering-like speech. They may have difficulty with initiating speech, excuse me, inappropriate silences. Um, you know, it's not uncommon that I've heard individuals tell me, well, I actually had childhood stuttering. I've had it in control probably my entire adult life, and now I feel like I'm having some of those same kinds of changes. Another type of speech change is hyperfluency, and this is where speech rate is very fast. One particular type is called palilalia, and you'll actually hear a video clip uh, of a gentleman with some palilalia a bit later in the presentation. But this can encompass compulsive, uh, effortless repetition of words and phrases, and oftentimes, sometimes uh, rate increases at the end of the utterance. And then another really important factor that can affect communication is that it takes more time for individuals to process information and respond. And if uh, caregivers or people talking with the individual aren't aware of that, they can often sort of talk over the individual or move on to the next topic before that person was really able to contribute to the conversation. Next slide. So there is good management opportunities to help with the symptoms of advanced Parkinson's disease, which allows individuals, even though these complications exist, to still have good quality of life, be engaged, and be able to communicate. 
And so we recognized in advanced Parkinson's disease, it becomes complex and it requires a good team, a multidisciplinary team that includes medical specialists, such as your movement disordered neurologist, as well as allied health. And there's non-invasive strategies, which can be behavioral, neuropharmacological, as well as some advanced invasive strategies, which might include things such as deep brain stimulation surgery. But all in all, these are individualized treatment plans that can really take into account each person's challenges as Parkinson's disease has advanced. Next slide. In terms of what we do in rehabilitation, speech, physical, occupational therapy, our goals in later stage Parkinson's disease sometimes are the same as early Parkinson's disease, and that is we want to maintain or improve your physical capacity. When we look at speech uh, things we want to improve, vocal loudness, vocal quality, speech intelligibility, and in terms of movement, we want to maintain your bigness of movements, your quality of movement, keep your posture good, as well as address balance so that those potential for fall risk is reduced. Some things that are unique to advanced Parkinson's disease is that vital functions become a bit more um, uh, important. So we want to maintain, for example, safety of swallowing so we can prevent things such as aspiration pneumonia. We want to keep you moving safely so we reduce that fall risk. And functional communication and functional movements really are the most important goals to both enhance your safety but also reduce any burden to the caregivers. And so using cueing and using family to help carry over rehab focused goals is not uncommon in advanced stages of Parkinson's disease. Next slide. And as I mentioned, a key and a multidisciplinary team um, is key. And you've got your medical team on the left-hand side and your allied health team on the right-hand side. So speech, physical, and occupational therapy is our area of expertise at LSVT Global, and so will be the focus of what we talk about here today. But we really recognize that behavioral intervention uh, is most often effective, the best effective uh, outcomes for improving communication and improving movement in these advanced stages of Parkinson's disease. Next slide. So now we're to our second polling question, and since we've defined what advanced Parkinson's disease is, um, we're curious how many of you listening would consider yourself um, or the person that you know or care for as having um, advanced Parkinson's disease. So we'll give you a few moments here to vote, and then uh, we'll see the answers. So Laura, I'll let you post the answers when voting's done. Okay, we'll just give it a couple more seconds here. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to close that. And here are okay. the results. All right, so um, we see that 20% feel like the person they care for or the individual is at an advanced stage, but most of you not. So this may be information that's useful for you as you care for somebody with advanced Parkinson disease or are thinking about the progression of Parkinson disease and how to have the best quality of life um, despite an advancing um, condition. So we'll go back to the slides, and what I'll finish off now is talk specifically about changes in our treatment LSVT loud, and then I'll turn it over to Heather to finish up really talking about LSVT big or, or the therapy for physical and occupational therapy. So next slide. So there are subtle changes that we, oh, no, we have a video, sorry. Uh, let's first take a look at a video and you're going to hear an individual with advanced Parkinson disease. He was stage four, he was in a wheelchair, but 100% cogn are very cognitively intact, very engaged, uh, and so communication was very important for him. Now please recognize the video picture 
uh, is slow and may lag behind the audio, so it's best to focus on the audio. You'll hear a short clip of him pre and then a short clip of him post. Been diagnosed with Parkinson's. When was that diagnosis made? Okay. What were your first symptoms? First symptoms was like I was sitting down on a bench. When did you first notice a change in your speech or your voice that you would associate with Parkinson's? I didn't notice it. My wife noticed that. And when did she notice it? Oh, probably. 84, 85. Okay, very good. Count from 1 to 25 for me. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Oh, we told you it's easier to understand you? Yes. Who? Oh, my daughter and all my wife. What oh. have they said? Tell me that again. They said that they understood. Is that right? Yeah, I hope all so. Right. Okay, so you could probably hear some of those characteristics I mentioned, most um, notably the increased rate of speech and some of that disfluency or repetitive speech. While it wasn't gone post-treatment, it certainly was minimized, and so using that cue of vocal loudness as a way to train helped him have some control, and if he was not initially understood, he knew what to do to improve that to repeat what he said in a louder voice. So what you see on the screen now is a snapshot of what a treatment session looks like for LSVT Lab. On the left-hand side are what we call our daily exercises. These work to improve core vocal loudness. On the right-hand side is really all about functional communication. So taking that improved loudness, putting it into speech, getting you to carry it over in real life. And we'll talk about some alterations that we can make um, across these exercises. So next slide. Sometimes in those first two exercises, which is a long ah that is held. Go ahead to the next slide, Laura. Um, or the high-low, where the exercise is ah or ah. The clinician may need to spend more time, what we call shaping good voice quality. So sometimes there's increased hoarseness or roughness, and that's why working with a speech language pathologist is so critically important. Uh, in some individuals, durations may get shorter, um, so maybe we have an uh, so short three to five second. Typically we do 15 repetitions, but with shorter durations we may do 20, 25 repetitions, so we're getting the same amount of vocal practice. Some people need a little bit longer rest periods between repetitions, um, and that's fine, and the clinician will monitor that. And we may need to provide more extensive or prolonged, again, modeling of the behaviors and shaping that good quality. Next slide. Um, in terms of functional phrases, these are phrases that we have individuals come up with that are 10 phrases you say every day in everyday life. We practice them at least five times a day so they become reminders or hooks or cues to you that when you're at home and say that, you think about your loud voice. Well, in some cases, individuals who may have some more cognitive challenges, maybe we need some family input to create those phrases. Um, as clinicians, however, we're always cognizant to be sure that we're actually getting what the person with Parkinson disease would say and wants to say, not in some cases what a spouse might like them to say. So the person with Parkinson disease is still an absolute key vital person in this process. Um, and we may do more than five repetitions, and in fact, for some patients, these ten phrases may be their key functional outcome that they can say, people can understand at the end of the one month of treatment. Next slide. 
In the speech hierarchy, this is where you take that louder voice and again practice it in speech. And a lot of that involves sometimes reading materials. So you might start, start with reading single words and then longer utterances, phrases, then to sentences, reading paragraphs. And if a person has difficulty reading for any number of uh, reasons, um, co-occurring language disorders, visual impairment, then we can make adjustments. And instead of having somebody read, we might use repetition. If vision is OK, but it's the words that are a challenge, we can use pictures for description. Um, and the goal is to really exercise the system talking and talking about things that are meaningful and, and important to each individual person. As I mentioned before, we also need to be sure we're allowing you enough time if there is a slower response and slower processing. And we use a trick that sometimes when we lose loudness, we'll go back to that good ah, uh, and we may revisit that special several times in the hierarchy to kind of restart the motor system, get it revved back up, and then use that loudness in good speech. Next slide. So calibration is this uh, concept of relearning how it feels to have normal loudness. Sometimes it may take longer in individuals with advanced Parkinson disease, but it still remains as critically important to find emotionally salient opportunities so that the person can feel the reward of improved communication. Next slide. So some additional considerations that the therapist might uh, uh, employ to maximize outcomes include some of the following. Next slide. So if there are concerns about cognition, providing a treatment room that may be separate from others and have few distractions so that it's easier to focus on the tasks that are being done. Oftentimes, we don't want other people in the room, and that may include family members. The clinician has the best opportunity to make change with the person, drive repetition, 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 and once the individual has got the basics of the task, then we may bring the care partner in so that they can learn how to model and learn how to become a good coach for their individual. It is also not unheard of that we need to treat beyond four weeks of treatment. Four weeks, 16 sessions is the standard LSVT loud dosage, and that's what we call the minimal dosage. And sometimes in advanced Parkinson's disease or people who've had deep brain stimulation surgery, we simply need more therapy. Next slide. And some adaptations for physical concerns. Um, sometimes coming to the clinic four days a week for four weeks, it becomes a physical burden. And by the time the person gets there, they're almost fatigued from the process of getting there. And if possible, we can do sometimes telehealth sessions so that you could be at home with your computer, not unlike what you're doing right now, watching the webinar. The therapist, such as myself, could be in her office, and we connect up over the internet and could do some select sessions that way, which can reduce some of that fatigue from travel. Um, also, we encourage our clinicians to acknowledge fatigue in individuals with advanced Parkinson's disease. Uh, validate it. It's a real feature. Give the best cues they have so even when you feel fatigued, you know how to communicate. And as I mentioned, maybe some longer rest periods. But we encourage uh, individuals, don't give up on behavioral treatment. It may take a little longer, but the value they can offer giving you something you can do for yourself can be very powerful. Next slide. So a few last things that may happen is more treatment sessions is a common strategy using external cueing, and that is in treatment the person may learn loud, physiologically improve their ability to be loud, but they still need reminders or cues from their environment. So uh, care partners, um, caregivers may have to remind them, say that again, use your loud voice. I have those top two strategies starred because we did a webinar with um, LSBT loud therapists last night, and we asked them, what strategies do you use the most? And those were the top two strategies. You may also need more frequent follow-up therapy. And so it may become that every two weeks you just come in for a session or once a month. 
There are some devices that your clinician may try. Uh, none of them are foolproof, but if the repetitive speech phenomenon is a real challenge, sometimes using something like altered auditory feedback can be a, 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 an option to explore. And finally, sometimes we need to use pacing, and that can be very helpful. So I'm going to show the last video, and then I'll say a few last words and hand it over to Heather. This gentleman has palilalia. You'll see a little clip of him in his pre-treatment interview, and then him working in therapy with his clinician, where he's using some pacing to slow himself down. Go ahead and play the video. Well, how do you say the bottom of the shire call? Maybe. This is the thing I play with. I left from some days in the fall of me. I'm going to have to take a bottom of the shire call. Tell me a little bit about your experience here. This is session 15. We have one more session tomorrow. Yes. Tell me what you've learned from the therapy that you've done. For the summer half of them. And talk slowly. Uh huh. Use this board. Okay. I want you to say that again using the board. I learned to use this board to slow myself down. Good. Good night. How are you? Nice. Well, I'm fine, thank you. Who's there? Let's go for a walk. Nice. What is, what's for dinner? Good, try that one again with the board. What's for dinner? Good job. Okay, so in conclusion, you could see how much that strategy of pacing dramatically improved his communication. And there's different forms of pacing that can be used. This was one example for him that worked well. But in summary, from the speech perspective, communication is so important to your engagement, your enjoyment, and your quality of life. And despite the fact that Parkinson's disease will advance, there are ways you can stay involved and keep communication. There are strategies we can adjust as communication impairments may get more challenging. And there are ways we can keep you communicating so that you don't have to think that that's something I'm going to lose um, as Parkinson's disease progresses. So with that, I will now stop talking and turn it over to Heather, who will take you through uh, the counter therapy LSVT big. Thank you so much, Dr. Fox. So I am a physical therapist, and I'm an LSVT big certified physician or physical therapist, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the program is all about, and then we're going to talk about how do we adapt this and how do we take into consideration difficulties and challenges that those of you with Parkinson's disease who are in the advancing stages are dealing with, or talk to you a little bit about what we do to make things a little bit easier to start with and how we progress you to be more challenged throughout this program. Next slide. So this slide that you're seeing in front of you here is a snapshot of the LSVT big treatment session. On the left side of your screen, you're going to see the maximal daily exercises, and these are seven exercises that we have based in part off of the LSVT loud sessions. And these are exercises that are aimed at helping you to um, have better core strength, to have improved posture, to sit taller, to step larger, to be able to roll in bed in an easier way, whatever the functional difficulty is that you're experiencing, we use these exercises as stepping stones to really move into the functional components of what you want to do. So in looking at the right side of your screen, you're seeing these things called functional component tasks. And these are functional tasks that you do every day, one of which is always sit to stand, because we know that many people with Parkinson's disease, as they progress through the disease process, have more difficulty. And it may be that you have more difficulty in certain situations more than others. It may be on a low, soft couch, or perhaps if you are dining out and you need to go to the restroom and the toilet is too low. 
And then there's other things that we work on with you that are specially made just for you. So whatever you're having a particular difficult time with or your loved one is having difficulty with, we tailor that to you. When we move into the next section, which are the hierarchy tasks, we're looking at big movement tasks. So we're looking at things like being able to transfer yourself in and out of a car or to help someone in and out of a car. How to get out of bed to get to the toilet or to be able to get to the bedside commode. So we're looking at steps of tasks that are multiple levels so that there's many different things that you need to do. And then of course in all of our sessions we focus on big walking. So whether you are using an assisted device or not, this is something that we work on. If you are someone who is currently in a wheelchair and you self-propel the wheelchair, we can show you how to actually propel the wheelchair in a bigger way. And as well, we, we encourage the care partners and people who are working with the individuals with Parkinson's disease to attend these sessions so that we can then also teach you how to do this treatment session at home. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we progress. So let's take a look at the next slide. What you're looking at here are the first two of the seven exercises, and we call these sustained movements. And that's because we hold these exercises for a certain point of time um, to really help encourage the stability in the muscles and the strength in the muscles. So you're seeing a snapshot of the exercise, and this is the hold pose. The exercise on your left is called the floor to ceiling because we start with the patient reaching out down to the floor, up to the ceiling, and then finally attaining this hold pose here. We work up to trying to be able to do this in a 10 repetition hold, but we're going to talk a little bit about how we can bring that down if it's someone with more advancing symptoms who can't possibly hold it that long. The second exercise you'll see next to that is the side to side, and you can see how the model in this picture is really pushing back with that back leg and reaching out big. You can see how you could take this exercise and make that a part of what you do normally during the day, reaching across to perhaps um, turn the alarm clock off, reaching across when you're in the car to hook and unhook a seatbelt, or perhaps reaching across just to pull up the blankets. So different ways of taking these exercises, using what you learn from the strength and the hold of them, and then applying them into everyday life. Let's look at the next slide. The next three out of our seven exercises are what we call multi-directional repetitive movements. So these are movements where you are moving the arms and the legs at the same time, and you're moving in different directions. So we have three here. We first have the forward step, where you can see the model is stepping forward. She's bringing her arms back. The next one is your sideways step, where the model is now stepping to the side, reaching to the side, and also looking to the side. And then lastly, we have the backward step, where the model is pushing her arms back and stepping backward. Now, I think many of you might be looking at these and thinking, well, I just don't have the balance or the stability to do this. And what we really want to teach you today is that we can adapt all of these poses to a seated position, and if necessary, we can even adapt them into a supine position, meaning when you're lying in bed, we can teach you how to do these movements, and again, using the exercises as a basis for helping you to make your functional movements safer and easier. And now let's take a look at our last two. These are our rock and reach exercises. What we're looking at on the left hand side of your screen is the model is now shifting her weight front to back and swinging her arms back and forth. The next exercise is the sideways rock and reach and this is where she's twisting all the way around and looking behind her. Again, when you look at these exercises, you want to think about how can they apply to my everyday life. So if we look at the first one, again, helpful with reaching up into a cabinet, reaching to put our arm inside a jacket, helping with weight shifting when we step forward. When we look at the sideways rock and reach, we can think about the ability again to roll over in bed, the ability to really work on one's trunk rotation with all sorts of things can really be beneficial with dressing, with getting in and out of the shower, and with so many other things. And again, don't look at these exercises and feel that you are fearful of these because you don't believe that you have the stability or balance. Again, both of these exercises can be adapted to a seated position as well as a lying down position. And we're going to talk about how do we adapt these for people who may be having more of the advanced symptoms of Parkinson's? So let's take a look at the next slide. 
we're going to talk about how do we take those seven exercises, um, what are the reasons for why we do those adaptations, and then we'll actually show you some video snippets of how we do that. First and foremost, we want people to feel safe. We do not want people to be fearful of falling and then not being able to do the exercises when they're not in therapy. So first and foremost, we want people to feel very, very safe. We want to ensure that you are successful when you're doing your exercises. If you're doing the exercises in therapy and every single time you're losing your balance, then we're not helping you to be successful. And that's why we may adapt it down to a seated position. We want you to feel like we are really reinforcing things. We're being positive with what we're doing in the direction of your exercises. Again, we're linking these exercises to your functional, functional things that you do every single day. And we want to support you to be able to learn how to adapt these exercises and perform these exercises even if you or the person you are working with has any kind of level of cognitive problems or they're also suffering from some of the non-motor complications. So perhaps that person is having more severe on and off times with their medication or perhaps dyskinesia, those extra involuntary movements are problematic. So although you may be dealing with more of the advancing stages and complications with Parkinson's, we still want to support your ability to learn and perform these. And again, if you are someone who is dealing with other issues, you're dealing with perhaps a bad shoulder or you have um, a congestive heart failure condition or you have diabetes or you have any host of other comorbidities, we again want to take those into consideration as well, again to keep you safe and healthy. And like I mentioned before, people with Parkinson's have motor fluctuations and we have um, this difficulty with the dyskinesia. So again, we can adapt those exercises, make them safe, and make you successful in performing them. Next slide. So what do we do? How do we adapt these exercises when we have these special needs? So if someone is able to stand, that would be the best case scenario. So perhaps you're not able to fully stand without holding on, so therefore we would give you a little more support. We would have you hold on to a chair, hold on to the wall, the top of a countertop, um, perhaps the, the back of a locked walker, something that's really going to support you when you're doing things. So we would perform them on one side of the body, switch our hold, and then perform them on the other side of the body. If someone were unable to stand, we're unable to perform them safely even with holding on. We can adapt those exercises, like I mentioned before, to a completely seated or what we call a supine on your back position. We can also uh, break the exercises down. So we can actually, when you saw the exercise picture before about the person who was shifting their weight front to back and swinging their arms, we're going to show you a little video later of how we can break that down where you can just perform the arms and then you can just perform the legs. Now, for the therapist who's going to be working with you, it means that your therapist is going to be providing you with more physical assistance, meaning that they're going to be putting their hands on you and helping to shape you and helping to move you into those positions. They're also going to use their own body to be a good model of movement for you to really help you to get the most out of what you're doing. I mentioned earlier that our goal um, at the minimum is trying to get patients to hold those movements for 10 seconds. Now, if that's not possible, we can decrease that time to whatever denomination we need to. If a person cannot perform the eight repetitions or ten repetitions, we can always decrease the repetitions. And our basic focus, no matter what we're doing with the exercises, for how long or how many we do, is that we're really going back to the good quality big movements because that's what's really going to drive you to be able to have safer and more effective functional fitness. Let's look at the next slide. We're going to take a look at the video here, and this is of Laura working with a gentleman who was a volunteer, and she is breaking down the exercise into the lower body and then into the upper body. And again, depending on where you are, will depend on what the quality of the video is like. So let's take a look at that. Let's do that together. Forward and back. And one more. Forward and back. Watch me. Okay. Big arms. Can you do that? Good. And a big finish. Good. One more. Big arms. And a big finish. Good. And then try the other leg. Good. One more. 
Good. Look to the right, big arms, and a big finish. Good. One more bow. Big arms, and big finish. Very good. Step back. Good. And finish. And one more. Really a big kind of bow in your waist. Step back. And finish. Good. Take a big bow. And end big. Good. One more time. Keep making make it bigger. Big bow. And end big. Good. Try to use your big posture as you rock forward and back. Good. Big posture. And then you're really just going to focus on your big arm swings without rocking. Good. So now we're going to take a look at the next series of adaptations, and this is a client who wasn't able to actually stand even with assistance to perform the exercises, and this is a video of how we adapted them for her in a seated position. Go for it. Bigger arms. Bigger, more deliberate. <laughs> Good. Go for it. Good. At a girl. Bigger arms. That's it. Big feet, big feet, big arms. Can you switch sides? Big reach, big turn. So you can see how we were able to take those fully standing exercises, adapt them to the seated position, and really still work on the quality bigness of those. So when we move away from the seven exercises and then we work on those functional component tasks, that was the one that I talked about earlier where one will always be sit to stand, we might need the family or friends to help us give some input that are the most meaningful to the patient. So if the patient is beginning to have uh, difficulty with memory or cognition, we're going to really incorporate the help of family and friends in there. And again, just because we say initially that we're doing these five times, we may need to actually increase the number of repetitions um, for people to be able to really learn these exercises. So these are the exercise movements. So we're looking at sit to stand, we're looking at example of being able to sitting down and bending down to put on a shoe, we're looking at being able to open up and lift the covers off the body in bed, being able to roll over in bed, or perhaps lift your legs in and out of a car. And again, these are not the only exercise movements that we do with these functional component tasks. These are going to be specific to your needs or to your loved one's needs. So please don't look at the list and think this is essentially what you'll be practicing. We will specially designate with your help and with your care partner's help which ones we'll use for you. Next slide. So after we've gone through the exercises and we've gone through those functional tasks, then we work on our hierarchy tasks. And again, those were our multiple step things, getting in and out of bed, fully getting in and out of the car. So again, we may need to take a look because someone may be too fatigued that instead of having our goal as someone being able to completely dress themselves, perhaps our goal will be just for that person to be able to help get the shirt on. Um, so we need to look at what that patient's ability is, what their 
um, tolerance to the activity is. And again, we talked more on the last slide about the need for repetition with the functional movements, but we also use a lot of repetition with the movements that we do. So if we're working with someone on getting dressed, putting a shirt on, instead of just having the person work on putting their arm into the shirt and bringing the shirt around one time, we may have that person put their arm in and out of the shirt five to ten times so that they really get the feeling of the big movement and effort they need to do that. We really need to work with you to allow you to have the time you need so your therapist is going to give you ample time and give you the quiet space that you need if you're having a little more difficulty with processing what we're teaching you and then you need a little more time to give us your response. And again, some people are going to need more cues so we are going to be talking to you more about thinking big and keeping it big. And sometimes we may even send you home with signs that say this, that act as nice reminders for you, that when you roll over in the bed and then you sit up on the side of the bed, that you remember to keep the movements big. Next slide. And big walking. Again, we have to look at what your goals are, what you want to be able to accomplish. And we may need to, you know, slow down, or I'm sorry, shorten of walking that we're doing. So it may be a shorter distance, it may be a very simple environment where we're just simply walking on a hardwood floor as opposed to going outside. We need to make sure that it's important to you, the individual, or important to the person you're working with. So if it's not the goal for the person to be able to walk around the block and it's just simply for them to be able to walk in the house safely, then we walk on that. If we're talking about other difficulties that happen with gait, perhaps it's freezing of gait, we're going to work on teaching you and teaching your care partner how to help you get out of a break or out of that fascinating fast, fast walking that happens sometimes that causes people to fall. And again, we're not saying that if you have an assistive device, we want you to get rid of it. We will work with you. If you have a rollator, you have a certain trekking pole or cane that you really need, we're going to teach you how to use it better and use it in a big way. And again, like we talked about in the hierarchies, we're going to give you time, we're going to let you have um, simple responses, we're going to make it easy for you to understand because we want you to really process what's going on so that again you're able to think about needing to keep things big. And again, sometimes we need more cues and sometimes you may need a sign. We've been known to put a little sign on someone's seat of their rollator that says think big or take big steps. So again, we will adapt and we will work with you to whatever your needs are. Next slide. And again, calibration like Dr. Fox was speaking about with regard to the LSVT loud. For the LSVT big, again, it can be challenging for someone to recognize the size or the speed of their movements and they may need more time to be able to learn how to do this. But it really is critical. It's very important. And we really need to work with educating the individual with the Parkinson's disease, but also with the care partners. Because if someone is having difficulty with memory, with dementia, then we need to train you, the care partner, to be the person to be their coach at home. And again, the benefits or the rewards of how much improvement someone is having might be harder for them to actually establish or for them to feel. So again, the therapist will work with you to help you understand where you're improving and how that is actually improving your functional ability, your safety, as well as your quality of life. And it's really important for us as therapists to work with you and your care partner um, to really find things that are important to you, things that mean something to you, things that you enjoy doing. Perhaps there are things that you gave up doing that really meant something special to you. So having something to work forward to have that goal and to feel the reward of your improvement of function is really what we're driving to. Next slide. So again, when we think about the strategies for adapting things for people who have any kind of cognitive issues or concerns, um, again, we may need to bring you into a quieter room. Your therapist may need to um, keep the distractions at a minimum. And in the beginning, we may need to just treat the person with Parkinson's and keep it very direct and very one-on-one -on -one until we actually bring the care partner into the program because we want that individual with the Parkinson's disease to have that time to really learn and to process what we are teaching them. Next slide. And again, practice, practice, practice. We say at the minimum that LSVT big 
is four times a week for four weeks, but likely for people with cognitive problems or very advancing symptoms, we're going to need to go beyond that four-week window. And once someone is really able to follow what we're doing, then that's when we're starting to talk about the care partner and the care partner coming in, learning what we're doing, and really being a coach so that they can reinforce and support the home practice. Because it's not simply what we do in the clinic, it's also what you will do when we're not with you. How do you take what we've taught you in the clinic with the exercises and the functional movements, and then how do you apply them to your everyday life? So we want to make sure that everybody who's on your team is well aware and well educated on how to help you best. Next slide. And we really believe that everybody deserves a chance with Parkinson's disease. We don't want people to discount um, successful treatments. We don't want you to think, look, I don't think I can do this because I'm in the advancing stages. Or we don't want you as a care partner, as, as a team member out there to think, I don't think that this person can do anything because these symptoms are too far ahead. We really know that people, even with the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease, can truly have amazing outcomes. We can make you have functional communication and movement of whatever it is to improve the quality of life. It may not that we're able to get you to walk five miles or return to your full golf game, but maybe now you're able to walk from the kitchen to the living room and carry on a wonderful conversation with your grandchildren and to feel comfortable and safe in doing that. So we really do believe that we can help everyone at every stage of the disease process using both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. Next slide. So we want to take a moment here and just summarize what we spoke about. So both LSVT Big and LSVT Loud are really applicable and they really do work with people with all stages of Parkinson's disease. And truly, all of these sessions are customized and made to the individual needs of that person. We know that LSVT Loud and LSVT Big both increase independence, speed, quality, and safety with not only communication, but also with functional mobility and activities of daily living. We want to restore your function. We want to improve your function. And then once you have it there, we really, truly want to help you to maintain that function. We acknowledge that those with advanced PD really do face some unique challenges. And it really requires the therapist and the therapy team to use creative solutions. And we really look to the care partner, caregiver, friends, family, um, home health aides, whoever that team is, to really increase their involvement so that we can really make that team effort to help that individual to face those challenges and to really make some excellent gains. Next slide. So we want to leave you with some further information and resources. Remember that on our website we always have the option of Ask the Expert, and that's at info at lsvtglobal.com at any time, any question. Um, big, small, or in between can be asked to one of our experts who are there. We provide not only an LSVT Loud, but also an LSVT Big Homework Helper DVD. And those are available both on our website as well as Amazon.com. And this is really nice for people who feel like they really need to be looking at what the therapist is doing and have that extra help at home. In the realm of LSVT Loud, we also have companion software that people can use at home, again, to get that extra practice that they need. And then finally, there are many, many webinars, much like the one you are attending today, where we talk to members of the Parkinson's disease community um, from anything from early onset to today's advanced symptoms to um, different ways of helping you with managing your Parkinson's disease using the LSVT Big and Loud techniques. Next slide. We've listed on here for you some of the most um, recent webinars that are going to be coming up. On March the 8th, we have evidence-based speech treatment using the LSVT Loud. And this is an informational webinar for speech and language pathology students. So if you're in contact with any speech language pathology students, please let them know about this. On March 16th, we're going to be having improving communication and movement through evidence-based speech, physical, and occupational therapies. So you get all three in one package. On April 13th, we have addressing difficulties with voice and the activities of daily living in Parkinson's disease. And then lastly, on May 11th, we have what we're calling Turn Up the Game 
are you getting what you should be getting out of LSVT loud and big? And that's going to be a really nice one for individuals who are currently in uh, therapy for the LSVT loud and big or have already completed it and want to know if they got the best um, for what they were doing. So we're really trying to teach people out in the community living with Parkinson's, their care partners, as well as their therapist. Next slide. We'd like you to make you aware of some fantastic Parkinson events that are coming up in this year. The Michael J. Fox Foundation holds something called Partners in Parkinson's. You can see that there are a number of places it's going to be held throughout the United States. You can find the information at partnersinparkinson's.org. The Davis Finney Foundation puts on a series of victory summits. You can see at their website, the davisfinneyfoundation.org. They also are holding them throughout the United States as well as Canada. Next slide. And then finally, we have the Parkinson's Unity Walk that is held in New York City, and that's at the unitywalk.org. And probably one of the most special conferences that is out there, um, a rare conference in which we put people with Parkinson's together with the professionals who care for them. This is the World Parkinson Congress. It is held every three years. This year, it's going to be in Portland, Oregon in September. So please take a look at the website there, which is wpc2016.org for lots of information on wonderful courses that will be available. And next slide. Finally, we want to let you uh, be aware of some grants that we have here. Uh, we have two grants that can be awarded to speech, PT, or OT students for $1,500. Um, we are happy to use that money towards uh, research that they are doing. The treatment research just needs to be in a neurological population. It does not have to be just in the LSVT loud or um, big certification there. So as long as it's research in the neurological population, we've left you with the email addresses um, for two places that you can get instructions on how to apply. Next slide. I'm going to turn the webinar over now to Laura, and hopefully we have some time for some questions that we'll be able to help you with. All right. Thanks, Heather, for that great webinar. Um, right now we have one or two questions that will take a few minutes to answer. I do realize that we're a few minutes over the hour, so if you feel like you um, have things to go and do, we certainly understand that, and uh, please feel free to, to exit the webinar. Uh, so just to review, there's a few ways that you can ask questions. One is by uh, typing in your question in the question box on your control panel, and we'll read that question out loud and answer it for you. You can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and we will unmute your microphone, call out your name, and you can ask your question out loud if you have a built-in microphone into your computer. Or you can email us at info at lsvtglobal.com or webinars at lsvtglobal.com and we will answer uh, any questions that you might have uh, after the webinar. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions here. Um, Heather, I'll give this question to you. Is LSVT advised before reaching advanced stages of Parkinson's disease? Does it help to stave off the advancement of symptoms? Fantastic question, and the answer is a resounding yes. Research in high-intensity exercise, such as LSVT loud and LSVT big, has been shown to kind of keep symptoms at bay and possibly prevent the progression so we like to have people, as soon as they're diagnosed, begin these sessions. You don't need to wait until you're actually starting to have functional problems or speech problems. You can begin LSVT big and loud at any point, and it's absolutely at its most beneficial in those early stages. So the answer is yes. Thank you, Heather. And I'll take the next question. Uh, great question. How do I find LSVT therapists in my area? Um, very easy. If you go to our website, which is shown on the screen here, www.lsvtglobal.com, the first tab that you'll see on the screen is Find a Clinician. Click on that tab, and you can select whether you're interested in an LSVT loud clinician uh, who's a speech-language pathologist or an LSVT big clinician who could be a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. Um, after you click on that, you can put in your search criteria, and we recommend for best results that you just put in your zip code. 
and then you can click on your search radius of uh, anywhere from 10 miles all the way up to 100 miles and all of the LSVT clinicians in that search radius will pop up. If you have any difficulties finding a clinician in your area, please email us at info at lsvtglobal.com or uh, call our office at the numbers listed on our website and we can uh, help you with that specific search too. So um, we also can give you some guidance on some good questions to ask if you are looking for um, a really great LSVT certified clinician and we hope they're all great, um, but we can certainly give you some guidance in that area as well. Okay, so right now I don't see that um, any other questions have come in. Um, please note that this webinar will be recorded and will be available on our website within a couple of days. We have many other webinars that are already recorded and available on demand on our website. If you click on the Patient Resources tab and uh, open it up, you'll see on-demand webinars. And we have many, um, perhaps 15 or 20 webinars that have all been, already been recorded. So you can simply click on those, uh, register for them, and those will open up for you um, free. If you have any ideas of future webinars that you'd like to see us present uh, that would be useful to you, please email us at webinars at lsvtglobal.com and we'd be happy to um, entertain those and develop webinars that are, that are helpful to you. So with that, we are going to um, say goodbye and thank you once again for joining us today. We hope that you'll be able to join us for many other future webinars. Um, at the end of this webinar, if there is a link that pops up uh, for the survey, we'd appreciate you taking a moment to complete the survey. If you don't receive that pop-up, we'll send you a webinar um, after the conclusion um, of, of the webinar through an email. So thank you once again, and we hope you all have a fantastic day.